Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. This is a revolutionary one coming straight at you from the circadian Canadian. That's right, folks. Guess what? I was once a doubter, and now I'm a believer. Well, I don't know if I'm a believer, but I'm not a full-blown skeptic anymore about whether or not this industry can actually create positive outcomes for humans using electric light. Is that a good summary, Greg? It's a good summary because now we have something that's somewhat definable. We'll see if it actually comes through and gets finalized. But yeah, good summary. Adam Lillian from the United, uh, Underwriter Laboratories has been researching lighting and the various studies out there. And he's come up with some interesting information for all you listeners. So check out this one. But for right now, we got to tell you about Kurtzon.com. Go to K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. That's Kurtzon.com specification grade leaders in lighting, Greg. That's absolutely there. You can check it on their website, all of their products. They have tunable white fixtures. They have unique applications. And they're going to be at Light Fair this year where we're both going to be. They are at Light Fair booth number 2758. So make sure to check them out because they're not the same company that you see over and over down the aisles when you walk. Kurtzon's different. It's worth checking their booth, 2758. American made, baby. Right out of Chicago, I think, right? Straight out of Chicago, Kurtzon. Absolutely. So go to K-U-R-T. Straight out of Chicago. Straight out of Chicago. Go to K-U-R-T-Z. K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. That's Kurtzon.com. They are specification and grade American made light fixtures, LEDs, right here in North America because I'm in Canada. And of course, don't forget about the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. Go to NAILD.org where we interviewed and met Adam Lillian. That's right. That's the first time I've heard someone come forward with proof. That's right. You're going to hear it first on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. You know what? Let's cut right to it right now because this is one of my favorite discussions ever. Coming at you, the Circadian Canadian. Welcome to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, Adam Lillian. Thank you, Michael. Say hi to Greg Eric. Hey, Greg. Hi, Adam. Thanks Glad for being here. here. Thanks. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the, the uh, uh, how can I call your presentation? Uh, nothing but groundbreaking, actually. That's the... the oh, thank you. The, one of the most um, audacious presentations I've heard thus far in the health effects of lighting. And I'm sure the listeners are very interested in it. But we have some housekeeping. You go first, Greg. A couple lighting dork things, and I need to ask you all since we're on. If you run into a fixture, and this happens a lot of time in the LED industry, where you uh, buy a fixture that's 120, 277 volt, mm -hmm. now you're in the field and you find out it's 480 volt. Is it you all listed to change for a, a field or a contractor to change the driver in the field to 480 volt? To up the voltage? My, I don't know. Okay. Uh, my understanding is no. Okay. Um, but it's it's certainly uh, what is on the listing itself. And the listing is very specific to the voltages. So somebody... Um, somebody out there might have a, a, a field selectable uh, product that was tested and rated and certified mm -hmm. to operate multiple voltages, but that would be clear in the in the certification itself. If somebody has a certification for for one set of parameters and then wants to modify it in the field, it's not um, typically UL listed for that. It's, mm -hmm. it's very specific. Okay, and then how about if you do a step down transformer? That I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've had. There's been some questions in the industry on that, so I don't know anybody has a clear answer. But my my peers would know specifically. They're they're okay. very you know highly qualified uh, electrical engineers. Uh, my background is more on the business side as a business development manager. My job is to know where the the lighting industry is going, and to ensure that UL. So you're the is one there. that knows. Because no one else. Finally, well, finally, finally, we finally I'm, 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 you know where it's I'm, going. I'm committed to finding out and okay. to know before we get there. Uh, <laughs> but somewhere between. Somewhere between the advancements that are happening as we shift away from illumination to horticultural lighting, which is fuel mm -hmm. for plants, and uh, circadian rhythm, which is which is health for for human beings in lighting, and Li-Fi, which is going to be the, the, the way the way we stream exactly mm -hmm. uh, that in the in the future, and the challenge is to understand all the parameters uh, that are in the industry that are seen and unseen, they're going to affect adoption. And that's what I specialize in. So the naked ape, 
Is that Marshall McLuhan or? No, I would give probably Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, he's uh, he's the the smartest Canadian of all time. <laughs> I love Just it. So you know, Marshall, where are you? Yeah. Second or third? I'm up there with them, <laughs> those guys. Yeah, <laughs> me, Jordan Peterson, and Marshall McLuhan. That's us. That's Canada for you. Top three. So the Naked Eight. Um, I always love it when it's when the truth is so obvious. Yeah. Okay. So the idea of circadian entrainment or light entrainment is very obvious. It's an obvious. It's one of those things that's self-evident almost of course the 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 earth revolves around the sun of course uh the animals are in tune with this process how could it be any other way like it's it's so self-evident it's almost ridiculous and the idea i read a book on a uh, human hibernation mm -hmm. that human like hibernation people think hibernation they go oh, people the the animal goes to sleep for four months and just burns all its fat. That's not hibernation means different sleeping patterns in the winter. That's what hibernation is. So animals says so humans actually hibernate as well, particularly right. humans from from northern climates will actually sleep a lot more in the winter and will their 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 systems will slow down. And all of this stuff is triggered by sunlight. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we know all this. Like it's it's self evident, but it's also now there's like you know science. Well, look, we have the paper. It says it on the paper here. Now we know it, right? Now for sure we know. It's funny you mentioned um, hibernation. My dad, when he was alive, was a <clears throat> a physician, a, a researcher, a surgeon, and one of the things that he researched was the brown fat that is uh, around the um, adrenal gland in the kidney. And he was he he led a research project to try to figure out if it was a if it was a gland in itself. And so for years, he studied uh, brown fat layer buildup in humans. And uh, I grew up with, with that as an environment uh, at home. So what's your brown fat like, son? <laughs> Let me see that brown fat. <laughs> he kept on trying to convince us that if we ran around all winter in Syracuse, New York, in T-shirts, we'd, we'd acclimate. Uh -huh. We let him try. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Couldn't find him. So um, uh, spending some time outdoors in nature every day. Yeah. Oh, big surprise. It's good for you. Yeah. Another self-evident thing that people have known. For now a that's long time. now that's self-evident. The 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 arrival of understanding the effect of of our circadian system has been a long time in development. In the 1700s, uh, the first uh, biologists started studying uh, plant uh, synthesis and, and started to uh, uh, mark the the effect of of the sun's uh, revolving. Uh, uh, the, the, the Earth's rotation around its axis. And you mentioned sure. earlier the, the sun revolving around the Earth. It's actually the, the rotation of the Earth is a 24-hour cycle. Sure. Uh, seasonal, seasonal has a different effect on our, on our rhythms. Uh, but the, the effect that this has and, and coming to the place today in, in 2019 where we're challenged to figure out this conflict between, between energy as the prime driver of our decisions and reducing energy to remove ourselves from fossil fuels so that we don't, we can stop paying um, uh, 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 the bank to, to borrow money to, to pay the, to pay for the fossil fuels coming over sure. from overseas uh, is all shifting too, because we're in a, in a country that's now becoming one of the prime uh, exporters sure. of natural gas. Now, energy. Canada doesn't like that, by the way. But uh, so let me, well, I was wondering when you guys are going to build a wall. Yeah, the walls. And get your southern neighbors to you pay You know what? For I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Canada and the United States have one thing in common. Both their leaders are deep narcissists. <laughs> that's How's excellent. That? Okay. That's a, that's a camaraderie. Yeah, all right. So that's one's on the left. The other's on the right. They're both deep narcissists. I love it. All right. So all this stuff we know anecdotally as humans that going for a walk in the sunshine makes you feel better. Yeah. Walking in the forest makes you feel better. They've known this for, for a lot of different reasons. Um what makes you think you can bring that indoors? You can't. Uh, however, we're in we're in, in uh, northern climates uh, that are inhospitable to us in the winter. We're in southern climates that are inhospitable to us in the summer. So we've created air conditioning and and uh, and heaters mm -hmm. uh, so that we can expand where we live. And because of that, we're trapped indoors. We can't bring indoors. Um, outdoor, we can't bring the outdoors in so much in an already built space. There were periods of time when we did quite well by designing spaces that that um, the architect and the and the and their their client attempted to bring enough indoor lighting in. There was a whole period in the, in the industrial revolution early on where large factories had sixty foot ceilings and huge windows, and that worked just fine for the workers. Sure. It's it's as we learned how to 
how to build shorter spaces so we wouldn't have to heat and ventilate them uh, to the same degree. And then we decided in, in the past 20 years that we could go from 1.2 watts per square foot to uh, to yeah, 0.6 watts per square foot. Yeah, energy efficiency, and, and, yeah. The, and the industry is taking a second look here. Um, well, that, the, the, in, the industry needs to take a second look. I think that the that a recommended practice uh, published by UL and and commented on by the whole world, and I'm hoping I'm hoping to uh, that we receive a lot of comments uh, from from all countries and all experts and people who are lay people as well. But until we until we have a serious dialogue and come to a form of a conclusion on a baseline for where we start, we're not really we're not really considering it all that much. We're we're arguing about this about the the fuzziness of the science. Okay, so far, well, here's what I took from your presentation, just to mm -hmm. sum it up for the listeners, because there's going to be five thousand to ten thousand you know, lighting dorks that are going to listen to this. Okay, gotta love it. And, and they're going to like say, I'm going to go sell circadian lighting, or I'm not after listening to this one. Okay, so I was always suspicious of horizontal foot candles, the measurement right. of the vertical of the of the horizontal surface right. as the guide to light levels. Right. <clears throat> um, I always suspicious of that. Uh, you don't drive your forklift. We don't walk around like this. You spend most of your life looking around at walls. Right. Um, a lot of stuff came out about seasonal affective disorder, and you'd have these old ten thousand lux. Um, things that people would shine in their eyes and stuff like this. What I've taken from your from your uh, from your uh, talk today was that you need to get those vertical foot candles into your eyes, mm -hmm. and they needs to be at three hundred lux, two hundred fifty, three hundred lux, and then and then the recommended practice gets very specific about the about the the difference between those two. But roughly speaking, yes. And you're sure that you're not going to cause any harm to anybody doing this? Well, the the, the challenge uh, is going to be taken up by lighting designers. And what, one of the things that lighting designers have to take into consideration are things like glare and discomfort. Uh, they also have to take into account that in, in um, age of, of, um, of the eyeball, uh, an older person has uh, a, a greater specular um, filtering system. And so, and so uh, glare is much more uh, a, an annoyance to them. Someone with a young eye um, so each each designer has to become familiar uh, with with the practices, and they have to also test and measure after the space is built to make sure that they've delivered what they set out to do. It, one of the concerns I have is so I think there's always these funny lies that I was told when I was a kid. One of them was that the world's running out of oil. Right. Told that my whole life. Now we have what, 10,000 years supply in North America alone or whatever it is, right? One of the great lies. The other things that I was always told my whole life that's becoming a lie too or in, sort of being revealed on the show is that the sun is bad for you. So wear sunscreen, wear sunglasses. So you'll make sure whenever you go outside, you put on your sunglasses so that you can't have those awful UV rays go into your eye. And it's actually coming around that eh, maybe you want that in your eyes, particularly if you're not spending eight hours straight at the beach. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it is actually good for you to receive that direct sunlight into your eyes. Um, which is it? Well, you mentioned um, the lie of of um, peak oil of fossil fuels, yeah. and if you consider at the time what was what was being considered um, as as a requirement, one of the requirements was to be able to withdraw it at a at a cost and a price that was reasonable. Okay. So when when uh, before fracking, sure. Um, th without that technology, uh, it was not possible to do it sure. at, a, at a certain price point. Um, after fracking, uh, without thinking too much about it, uh, sure. perhaps it wasn't very affordable when you consider the impact that we've had on the environment and and on and on people. It, it, it's, it's helped. It's helped tremendously yeah. as a as a as a revenue generator. And it might be it might be a transition um, phase. Going from fossil fuels to something that's that's sure. more renewable. Yeah. So when we look at when we look at um, outdoor lights, it's, it has it has at least as many nuances uh, as something as simple as, as accessing fossil fuel and, and putting high pressure steam sure. into into shale uh, into shale uh, rock. Um, going outdoors, you're um, you're increasing uh, the uh, degeneration of your cell structure, and and as we try to rebuild our cell structure, uh, cancer can form. Uh, early on in my career, I did cancer research with multiple myeloma yeah. patients, which is a which yeah, is a bone marrow, a bone marrow cancer, and um, and that's uh, to 
of our knowledge not affected uh, by sunlight, uh, but the generation of of the of components of the eye uh, based on on UV is very real. Uh, we're we're studying it as well at UL in in something as simple as coatings for LED, for LED uh, diodes. Uh, conformal. So codex. how do you know that we, you know 250 lux is a lot of light to be shining in someone's eyes, or 300 lux? That's a lot of light. The it, how would you define a lot of light in that case to being out on the beach? Um, and no, but you're going to be you're going to be entering the interior environment. So people go to the beach. And people rarely spend eight eight to eight hours in the sun without hats and covering up or whatever. Right. Very rarely do people do this. Sometimes they'll go and they'll have their bathing suit on and they spend six hours at the beach, five times a year maybe. I mean, a max, a Canadian, maybe, maybe 10, 20, something like that, but it's definitely not every day, right? But people are going to be in work environments now where I guess subjected would be an interesting word to use. They're going to be subjected to this circadian rhythm experiment. It's not an experiment. The experiments have been happening uh, for decades now. Okay. And, and uh, in the recommended practice, I believe there's uh, over 60 uh, referenced uh, publications from around the world. And I saw from, that 62, from, you said. And a number of different, uh, uh, I'm sure that's what it is. The uh, Those research uh, uh, pieces were done uh, under very tight scrutiny uh, by some of the world's best researchers, under grants uh, from from very uh, concerned uh, parties. Sure. And and so the experimenting um, that you refer to isn't, isn't delivering 250 lux to the uh, uh, vertical surface of the retina, okay. um, and and the designer uh, with the recommended practice will be empowered to figure out how to do that in a way. What was that the outcome that these uh, the positive outcome that these uh, sixty two studies kind of all agree upon? What is it that they get? For, what is it that people get from this? Well, they, they they certainly don't all agree. Uh, but if one takes a step back and and considers a baseline, and and the baseline meaning where do we start? Not not where do, not we're not really shooting all that high. We're saying, we're saying, how do we uh, deliver uh, healthier indoor spaces uh, in when we've been underlighting and and affecting things like depression, diabetes, um, certainly seasonal effect, effectiveness disorder. And coming from Syracuse, I think I should be an expert in that. Sure. But the but the the result is intended to be um, uh, uh, better entrainment. Um, higher alertness um, and better sleep, and when we when we when we mess that up and we disrupt sleep patterns, and we don't allow the immune system to do its job and and the cells to repair themselves uh, at night as they've as they as we've evolved for These them are to some do. Monster claims, Adam. No, they're all, they're, it's all in the research. And the fun part is is I was where you were when I first when I first uh, uh, learned of this potential recommended pa- practice being published. Uh, I had I had a lot of. I had a lot of loud uh, comments. In fact, my comments were so loud, I was invited to join the task force. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've learned my lesson. Um, yeah. having, having joined the task force and, and challenged uh, the members of the task force and the researchers on the task force and having read uh, the research reports and, and, and having a, a background in cancer research from early on. Um, so these um, are double-blind, re- replicatable Research papers well, that have been peer reviewed by uh, scientists. You're you're referring to a, a medical practice, okay? Yeah. Uh, and so the double blind and or whatever, and, whatever you call a PhD, the stuff they do. But like well, the, they've measured it. They said this is our results. You can now replicate it. If you'd it like to. Well, in fact, in, in, at, a, at this early stage, it's not totally typical that uh, an exact study would be replicated directly right. because there's too much new research to do. Sure. Um, in medical, you have to do that numerous times. Sure. But in something like uh, circadian effective design, uh, yes, the, 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 the dozens and dozens of, of medical research paper findings support each other. And what do they support each other on? Uh, one, one simple thing is that we're, we're uh, providing too little light during the day, yeah. and we're vi- we're providing too much light at night. We're negatively affecting people's health, sure. and by negatively affecting their health in a way that's easily remedied, lighting, um, as opposed to a lot of the other things we're dealing with. Um, when we when we when we talk about pharmaceuticals sure. in this in, in our drinking water, mm-hmm. that's that's a little bit more complex, and you don't know where to start. Sure. But if you can bring in if you can bring it two hundred and fifty lux uh, into the retina. Uh, in the morning hours, and reduce your your uh, lux levels to less than 100 lux in the evening, um, and and you can 
positively affect people's health and well-being, we as an industry have have an obligation to understand if if we think that's accurate. If we do think it's accurate, we have a responsibility to act, but not before. So the, you are saying that you know it's accurate. I'm saying that I know that the that the recommended practice will do no harm, and that the results that are achieved when somebody hits a circadian uh, stimulus design of 0.3 in a work environment, that they that both self-reported and um, and and medically tested results are positive and and provide the results that are promised. That's, That's a social media clip right there, buddy. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. I, I have to ask a little on, on UL. So I always understood UL as a certification body. You put a stamp on it. It's UL listed. We do that as well. Okay. So how many recommended practices do you guys do? Do you have, is it your number? The one we're talking about is UL RP, uh, RP mm-hmm. 24480. Right. So does that mean you've done no 24,000? No. And in, in, in fact, um, uh, it's, it'd be good to understand that the uh, part of UL that's publishing the recommended practice mm-hmm. is the same part of UL that, that is relied upon to publish uh, a standard. Now, that doesn't mean developing the standard. So there, we have two sides of underwriter laboratories, or, or UL. The underwriter laboratories part is the not-for-profit side, and they have the publishing arm, and the, the for-profit side um, is doing the, the certification uh, and testing. It's the not-for-profit side that is uh, running the task force, okay. and they're using their intellectual property of of uh, getting using using standard consensus um, uh, proprietary approaches to to gaining input from all over the world. Um, so, so as a recommended practice, uh, the, it's actually the task force okay. that includes the, and, and the task force. Um, uh, the, the people on the task force are, are, are very well published, but it has a, a host of scientists and researchers. Uh, it includes uh, uh, two of the researchers from the Lighting Research Center, uh, Mark Ray and Mariana Figura, um, but it also references documents from, from all over the world and research uh, that, has been, that has been published. And, and to your point, Michael, of, of you know, is it, is it uh, you know, double blind and verifiable? While it doesn't work that way, the, the the components, you know what I mean when I ask that. Yeah, the components of the of the recommended practice are validated by all the research. Mm. So there's not there's not research that's sound there's not sound research that conflicts. There's not, a, to my knowledge, there's not a single piece of of solid research that conflicts with the recommended practice. Now I can't say that because I haven't read every research piece out there. Uh, but what what the research what the recommended practice relies upon is 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 a, a baseline of understanding that's accepted. And we've even uh, opened up the the early part of the publication process was was working uh, with with um, a lobbying group for electrical manufacturers in North America, and uh, they read the report and got to weigh in and had some very constructive uh, uh, points of view, and those. Uh, uh, constructive points of view were were uh, put into the document and helped make the document even better. Now that's not that's not the world of of experts, uh, but we did test uh, the recommended practice and, and threw it out to to uh, key players that were selected by the lobbying group. How many lighting recommended practices has you all done? I believe this will be our first. Yeah, this is an audacious one, buddy. So this yeah. is number one. Yeah, is <laughs> yeah. this not? This is like this is the number. I mean, to, who did you piss off? Oh, um, in <laughs> in in anything like this, when whenever something whenever something advances this far this fast, yeah, um, there's gonna be a lot of there's gonna be a lot of. Uh, I mean, typically, lighting a lot of frustrated people practices are IES, at least in the lighting industry. Uh, and if, if I'm not mistaken, they've published over 170 of them, including uh, recommended practice for for hospital uh, illumination, for tunnels, for you keep on going, you know, for parking lots. Um, and actually, um, IES is working on their own version of a so, recommended practice for for circadian. So why did UL feel they needed to step up and do it? Well, there's the, I, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. Um, when is too early to stop practices that are hurting people? I don't know if that's the right way to describe it. I mean, that's a matter of opinion. I'm like, I'm, like I liked your first do no harm approach. We have a, mm-hmm. we have a podcast on Flickr called first do yeah. no harm. And, um, you know, I, I felt like the, you know, we brought back the Flickr issue um, the 5,000 K at night, I think is a disaster in the street lighting. 
I don't know if you agree with that. You mean the AMA report that, that tied? Yeah, but I mean, just even even like anecdotally driving down the street, there's glare bombs everywhere. A five thousand k light. I mean, I don't need I don't need an AMA report. To well, know. a well a, a well designed luminaire placed yeah. properly at the right height with yeah. the right distribution sure. at five thousand Kelvin should be no problem and for dark for sky night. friendly in that too yep. as well. That like should be problem. no should be no problem for human beings. It's it's when we don't understand all the parameters sure. of what we're doing, then we put to your point glare bombs. Yeah. But a glare, you can have a, th- a three, you can have a twenty seven hundred Kelvin glare bomb. I guess so. Except that I I, I, I have so many questions I want to ask you. Okay. But the first one I'm going to ask you is what is the difference between glare and circadian effective lighting? Well, they're, everything's different about them. Um, the, where they're where they're somewhat tied together yeah. is when you when you move away from horizontal foot candles on a work surface. Mm-hmm. And you're looking to deliver vertical foot candles to the retina. Mm-hmm. You're naturally Im- introducing uh, the potential for glare. Okay. And and while glare is perhaps better studied outdoors than it is indoors, mm-hmm. we need to get really good, really fast at understanding it indoors. And one of the ways of of doing that is is asking human beings because you can you can you can photometrically measure. Uh, glare until you you're can, blue in the face, but you can yeah, and you can sure. you can define it. But until until you have your user base sure. uh, in a space operating in the space sure. um, uh, where where somebody says somebody says that's really annoying to me, and yeah. if you ask them enough questions, you'll probably you'll like probably glare. get to glare pretty quickly. You know what's funny is that I think my my favorite way to light an office is with a hundred percent indirect fixture on a ceiling. Yeah. That's I, I that's and you but you know what that's going to need more watts per square foot. It does. Period. End of the story. The you slap that in at like a thirty three thousand K, maybe some dimmable controls. Baby, that's a nice lighting system. When I was surprised, I was surprised with the recommended practice that an indirect uh, fixture scored much higher in delivering circadian stimulus. Is that right? And when when I I kept on studying the pictures, I kept on studying the the energy projections of the of the light in the space. And it finally occurred to me that we do so much to avoid um, glare. The, the the space we're in right now has one, two, three, four, five, like twenty four cell parabolics on okay, a two by four. This is state of the art ninety five. I'd say <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, and geez, if we if we dusted those those off, they'd be even shinier. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've done all that to avoid having to look directly at a lamp, sure. because we made some assessment at some point that 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 horiz- that horizontal is what we're aiming for and vertical we want to we want to eliminate yeah there's a there's a there's an argument that parabolic lenses cause the seasonal affective disorder outbreak that's interesting i never heard that yeah Liv- no there's an i can't remember where i read that but so parabolics came out in the mid 90s right like strong the little tiny pair of cubes yep. that shoot oh, everything yeah, yeah. straight down yep. like these ones are a little bit better but the original ones you'd oh yeah swap out those lenses and put in those parabolics man yeah i was balling on that for about 10 years <laughs> ripping out acrylic lenses and putting in parabolic loops yeah. shot all the light straight down all of a sudden you look at the office there's no vertical foot candles in the office and you and you're in a cave because a cave. there's no there's no there's no, wall, there's no there's no light on illumination on the walls so millions of those <laughs> saying it's healthier for you look at your computer screen da, 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 da. and so i'm always very wary about the snake oil uh adam I got this circadian effective lighting me, here in my box. Well, let me let me actually turn this to a positive point that sure. that'll help your your listeners because ninety eight point something I'm making it up of of, of the, the the light the illumination in indoor spaces that we're going to be dealing with over the next fifty years is already sure. built. Uh, the window and the fenestration has pretty much been yeah, set, it and it's really expensive to go and punch a new hole and 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 to put in sure. new windows. So we're we're talking. To large degree, retrofitting into circadian. Retrofitting into circadian—that's the name of the show. Buddy. There you go. And yes. and with our overhead lighting, and the fact that we happen to have a forehead and we happen to have, you know, eyebrows. Mine happens to be pretty big too. So is yours. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, a little makeup. I keep going. <laughs> so the so we we work so hard to make our overhead lighting almost totally inefficient at. At a, at a vertical delivery of, of Lux to... There was a guy that was going after best product. I'm not going to say the name of the company, but the whole thing was that there was no vertical foot candles. Yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, I don't like that. Yeah. And so and so when we're retrofitting, if we if we take a look at the expensive lighting that we've already that we've already bet on, 
It's our overhead recessed troffers and some downlights. There's more of those than Americans. And I, I but not more than Canadians. Uh, there's more troffers than there is Americans. I, think. I believe that's, yeah. that, would, that would make sense. Yeah. So the, so we're not going to rip out the guts of the troffer and put in a retrofit kit that tries to deliver uh, more vertical lumens okay. without a lot of consideration of cost and return on investment is always a big consideration here as, as I, I, I well, you made talk. some productivity claims. Okay. So one of the, once you one get of those, into those health effects and productivity claims, the ROIs become extremely attractive, actually. Um, it depends on who you're talking to. But let me, let me make this case. If, if, if retrofitting into circadian is going to be expensive, difficult, and, and if a better alternative exists before we do that, um, then perhaps one of the answers is wall washers and desk lamps. So... It needn't be a huge expense. It needn't be a uh, a total retrofitting of a space. I don't like to hear that. But if I I hear you because as, as you know as in, in the oh, lighting industry, light. layers yeah. of light. It, it goes back to that. Sure. If, if I drop a thirty lux uh, table lamp uh, right uh, right in front of me, and and uh, I can solve I can solve the two hundred fifty lux without too much trouble. Mm. If I want to do it elegantly, and I have layers of light, and I and I reevaluate the reflectivity of my walls. The reflectivity of my ceiling, especially if I'm using indirect, and even the reflectivity of the floor. But let's not forget, you've got furniture, sure. you've got surfaces. Um, I walk through airports, and airports have a knack these days for putting highly reflective um, modeled surfaces that we couldn't produce even 10 years ago. Sure. Either made of steel or it looked like sculpted sand, sand drift, uh, pla white mm -hmm. plastics and stuff like that. When I look at those... I'm fascinated, and I think I, I, I think of those as the backdrop to our cubicle that we that we farm in today, and and I think of the the fabric that we put on the back of those cubicles behind our computers, and they're you know, remember the the rust colored orange, yeah, sure, and the and the dark grays, sure, yeah. and we we put a, a, a thumbtack in a push pin into it, and we we hang up our post it notes on it, and we put pictures of our family on yeah, it. Yeah. Well, what if that was considered the luminaire? What if that reflective? What if that reflective surface? Oh, it's not reflective today. Good. Let's replace them all. Let's let's sculpt surfaces and let's let's hang a, a, a light above our steel case um, uh, cubicle. Let's hang it right off of it, a little pendant light, and let's have it pointing not towards the eyeball, but let's have it wall wash the space behind our computers, and let's put a motion sensor on that device. And let's know when I'm sitting in there, in front of there, uh, for two hours. Or if I'm willing to, if I want to tune it up a little bit, and I and I and I test this out with the Dasimeter, which is a device that I wear that can tell how much how much uh, uh, lux I'm delivering to my day retina. Dasimeter. Yes, a Dasimeter is one of the common devices. Um, and and every, basically, I, th I think every every lighting designer will end up owning one soon. You heard it here on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast, folks. Get yourself a day seminar. <laughs> this is, goes back to what we were saying. You see, everybody needs their own individualized light to go everywhere with them. That's right. That's basically what we're doing. Well, it's we'll actually, over each person. I'll take that a step further. Yeah. Get a picnic table. Yeah. Yeah. It, we shouldn't be having this podcast inside a, a hotel room. We should be outside. Let's go. Let's go right now. <laughs> let's go right now. You know, yesterday, we hadn't been out of this hotel for two days. So we, Greg's like, let's go outside. We went outside. It was like, Boom. Beautiful day in Reno. The air was fresh and that. And yeah, there's there's something to it for sure. Mike, um, I'm, Mike, I'm glad you brought up the, some so somewhat politically sensitive big issues like um, like uh, you know uh, fossil fuels and and um, and you know big claims and things like that. Uh, I think that that part of the confusion in the industry is we have a a high disposition to look for controversy and take a and take a side and vote on it. That's American tribalism. Exactly. Exactly. Right? It goes back to how you crazy people watch students play sports. Who cares about students playing sports? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right? right. You're from Canada. I couldn't understand why you were wondering about that. Yeah, who watches students play sports? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You guys get all, oh, I'm Ohio State. I vote Republican. Oh, is this a, oh, I vote Democrat. I'm a proud American. And then you guys are so big on being on the team and supporting wait, your wait, team. Wait, have you guys, team. Have you guys heard that we all get trophies for participating now? Oh, that's, yeah. Well, let's not go down that road. That's okay. real gross. 
That's where it starts to get gross. <laughs> I tried to tell my son, look, you lost 7-3. The other team won. And they won because they scored more goals than you did. Yep. <laughs> the goal is for you to... The reason you're out there is because you want to score more than the other team. But anyway, let's get back to Greg. You got a bunch on your list. I might, I might, I might, I'm still blown on this a little bit. I'm not sure I can accept any of this, Adam. Let me just kettle it for a bit. Go ahead. Yeah, Greg. no, I guess I'm going back to the recommended practice and just how that relates to the industry and... So you said IES is working on one too. Is it going to be competing recommended practices? Because to me, then that's not a recommended practice at all. If the IES has one and the UL has one and they contradict each other. DLC them. comes out with one. And DLC says it. Well, the uh, well DLC is not working on one. Okay. Um, that's good news. Uh, CIE um, uh, has a, a, has formulated a, a position. Mm -hmm. uh, the well, we, we use the term loosely well standard uh, it, but it's not really a standard. It's a recommended practice in, in my mind. So you already have you already have two um, potentially out there. The one that, that's under re public review right now uh, by UL is not published, um, uh, and 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 there's even there's a small possibility that it won't be published. Mm -hmm. That has not been determined yet. It a lot depends on on the public comment. Mm -hmm. um, but as I mentioned, it's already been through a series of that. Yeah. So um, I hear you. When I when I think of when I th when I think of something that's much more rigorous than a lighting recommended practice for a tunnel or a or a hospital, this is a person, and I not a yeah facility any longer. And I th when I but when I think of medical, you're not talking about lighting up the space. You're talking about lighting up the naked ape. Yeah. <laughs> Light that bastard up. He's gonna feel better. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> the, um, I, I think one of the the challenges that we're dealing with here is that we we're, we're so. We're so hard on lighting. Um, I've got an ergonomic chair. Mm -hmm. I've got a stand up, sit down uh, desk that makes me healthier. I got a treadmill what, desk too. I just got it. And yes. and and what evidence did I ever demand uh, to, to to vote on uh, before mm. I decided to have a, an ergonomic chair, uh, something that, that supports my lumbar? But lighting, uh, because because you know it's it's a very deep and esoteric and and scientific and artful uh, field. We all love to argue about things. So well, that's because I don't really think we know what light is yet. I hmm. I don't think we really know. I was I interviewed Go a little Dr. further on that Dr. Veach, right? Mm -hmm. And we were talking with her, and um, we basically she said, "Look, you know, anthropologists, biologists, physicists, um, you know, all sorts of different scientific disciplines are all moving into figuring out what light is, how it affected our evolution, all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff." And I made the comment, I said, this is like the fish figure in there out there in the water. Yeah. What is light? All the energy you have from fossil fuels comes from light. Exactly. It's all light energy. Yeah. Right? May, you know, we don't even know how it works, yeah. really. We are creatures of the light in a sense. When you say we don't know how it works, we don't what do you know mean? how it works. How do you know how life works? Oh, li well, light and life are. Yeah, like how you do you change like, a, You change a couple of letters. No, but I mean, that. yeah, no, no. What I'm saying is that. Everything comes from a nuclear fission reaction, a nuclear bomb that's going off for the next two billion years. We did um, just discover the, the first visual depiction of a black hole. Yeah, there you go. So now we're, 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 we're spinning around the sun at 14,000 kilometers an hour. Right. Right. The sun is spinning around the Milky Way galaxy at 114,000 kilometers an hour, something ridiculous like that. And we're getting smashed. We're sucked in this light suction. From the sun as we whip around the universe what the hell do we know about how it works do we care how it works as long as it doesn't stop and we get thrown off but yes well there you go i mean but yeah all that sort of stuff sure i mean are we going to keep going that we can get into all these existential questions but the reality is it's like for me there's to say that we know that this is going to help people i just have a hard time with it I just have a feeling that there's going to be something that's going to come out that's going to say, actually, we shouldn't have done that. Do you, Michael, do you suck on a root when you have a headache? Uh, that's you. Are you trying? No, of course not. <laughs> well, I take Advil liquid gels. Well, aspirin is a root. Uh, okay. And, and. I don't rub mold on cuts either. <laughs> Moldy bread either. I take antibiotics when I have a bacterial infection. Yes, we do learn things. You're right. And. But did we know that there's going to be all these problems with superbugs when we started using antibiotics? You know, we have there's unintended consequences to everything. Well, what's the unintended consequence of of poor indoor lighting for over a hundred years? That's a good point. I mean, Dr. Venkat said that you know that poor indoor lighting is in fact the greatest productivity invention ever. How so? There's nothing that increases productivity more than 
adding light to night. Being able to see. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, uh, being being able to see at night is the greatest light, artificial light, sorry. Electric. Electric light mm-hmm. and uh, is the greatest productivity invention ever and the greatest security invention ever. There's a book, I forget the author's name, but it's called How We Got to Now. Okay. And it talks about the the evolution of lighting and how it's changed our civilization today. It's really fascinating. It covers about six different areas, mm. but but the one you just mentioned is is very well written about in that book. Doctor, there's another one called Disenchanting the Night. Mm. It's a it's a book by it's translated from German. I read it in university many years ago, and that book stayed with me. It's like <clears throat> talks about how how the creation of artificial light is really s- deeply fundamental to every other productivity game we've had. It's why I took some risk in my presentation this morning uh, to this Just group. Just a little bit of risk. You took this <laughs> and um, I, I, actually, I thought I was holding back, but um, but bringing up the concept of of how we came to discover light, how many millions of years ago, and how it is how it's affected our 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 being, much less our society, and 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 who we say we are today. The 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 concept of of lighting the night, the concept of 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 cooling the north, the concept of excuse me, uh, warming the north, cooling the south, and our expansion on this planet is a phenomenon that I don't think we, t- we, we take nearly as much um, credence in as we should. It's, it's something we miss all the time. And so to come to a group of, of manufacturers and distributors today in a, in a um, hotel ballroom with, you got to see the you got to see the patterns on these rugs. It's yeah, pretty wild. It's, okay. it's pretty. Um, someone actually got paid to do this, but um, <laughs> but to 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 bring up the concept of of where light came from and, and when we discovered it and what we've done with it today, and it's only been in the last blip of a second, second. that yeah, we seriously. that we, for for a hundred years that we've lit indoor spaces the way we are, um, to to discover this early on. Hey, we haven't been doing such a great job. Uh, we we might need to we might might need to course correct, and maybe energy's not the penultimate uh, final place we need to get to. One of the things that, that, that coming and doing this talk furthered my, my own thinking, uh, which surprised me a bit, was the, the last point that I made in the talk, which is that today we focus on energy and we do a great job of it. And I believe the Department of Energy uh, federally created the systems benefits charge and then we mandated the, the utilities to collect these taxes from the ratepayer for gas and electric, and we make sure that if you pay for a gas um, tax, that it, it comes back in, in the form of gas. And if it's residential or commercial, we, we're really careful about all that. And so we've gotten to a place today where we're driving towards 0.5 to 0.3 watts per square foot. Well, what if the equivalent for where we need to get to is the National Institutes of Health creating a tax on some part of our medical system? Mm-hmm. Whether it's whether it's uh, diabetes drugs, depression drugs, exact things that we know that that light uh, can can I- improve, and what if that became a, a systems benefits charge that was then managed uh, and given as rebates to folks who do circadian effective design Whoever inside of buildings? Whoever comes up with that rebate is going to get chewed up and spit out by me. I'm going to be selling tons of circadian. Yeah, not spit stuff. out, but you're going to be using. Oh, it. baby, start over. Industry yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, hang on. So, hang on. Hang on a second. Let's drop sure. back here. There's something I wanted to say. Um, oh, geez, I just so had it in my head, but then you hit onto the rebates again, and I just get all crazy. <laughs> um, but the, uh, geez, what was it? Uh, you were saying about your talk. Oh man, Greg, help me here, buddy. National Institutes of Health. Yes, yeah. there was something I wanted to say uh, about it. Um, Ah, oh, shoot, I lost it. Darn it. It was, it was, it was actually the best thing you were thinking so it far. Was, it was. <laughs> I can see it. I feel like yes, it. because the light is touching us. That's here. right. You know, we're swimming in this. You know that's that, right. right? I'm moving the light right now. Yes. So, uh, but so. Uh, I guess one question, and maybe you can think about it, but this recommended practice, and if it becomes an accepted practice, it's going to drastically change our industry. Do you think it has the potential to do that? Where we're going to go I know, into every facility and say, "Well, now you do this." I, I'm, I'm afraid we won't, yeah, because um, uh, it's not how we tend to do things. I, I think of I think of the penetration of LED lighting in indoor spaces. Um, I've asked probably half a dozen people 
in, in this last 24 hours, if they think that the Department of Energy's projection of a 12% penetration of indoor LED lighting is accurate. And I had one person here say they think it's about twice that. I think it's more than twice that. And in so Canada, in Ontario, it is anyway. I think and, so. And then in, in the meantime, we're sitting under plenty of 32 watt uh, <laughs> fluorescent tubes. Yeah. Um, and oh, I know what I was going to say. Oh, good. Go okay. for it. Here, here I, this I'm is going to be brilliant. No, I think it is. I'm so sick of energy savings, dude. Yeah. I want to be able to use in my life as much energy as I want. And screw you, you make it clean. That's what I say. Yeah. Go make some clean energy. Yeah. Get off my case. Because you know what? Energy is almost like a human right, dude. Like it's borderline. Electricity, access to electricity is getting damn near close to being a human right. Okay? And, you know, it's like I want to be able to use as much electricity and energy as I want. And I don't want anyone to tell me not to. Oh, you may feel guilty. So Whatever. No, 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 buddy. Like being a access to energy is one of the most wonderful things a human can have. So let's give as much as we can of it. So you can make circadian friendly systems. You can build wonderful devices in factories and all sorts of stuff. I think like the lighting industry has done everything it can to reduce its energy consumption and no industry can even come up close to what we've been able to accomplish. Okay. Where is it coming from the generation side? They need to make clean energy and they need to make it a priority like the moon. We're going to go to the moon. Remember that guy? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was a badass thing. What are you talking about? Going to go to the moon, eh buddy? Yeah. We kidnapped this Nazi guy named Werner Braun, Von Braun <laughs> and he's going to take us to the moon. <laughs> Just yeah. curious. I, I hope you're as passionate about water um, oh, rights totally for people good. and um, as, as and 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 Dude, uh, like, a reasonable amount of health care. You know, but being Canadian, okay. I mean, so you, here, you want to know the difference between Canada and the United States? I'll find, sum it up for you in, in, in like one line. Okay? Hey, hey. Um, Canadians have the right to health care, mm -hmm. and Americans have the right to bear arms. That's a good way of putting it. Th those are the fundamental differences. Yeah. Now, Canadians have the privilege of owning firearms if they wish. And it's very discouraging. You know, you're very heavily discouraged from owning firearms that are designed to kill the human animal only. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in the, in the U.S., uh, health care is a privilege. Yeah. And but anyone can own a gun. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. So those are the differences between the United States and Canada. Fundamentally, that's it. But. Um, I'm not done yet. No, I'm not. That's the symbol for being done. Wait, that was that, just to check. That was the brilliant point, right? No, the energy. We need. Clean oh, gotcha. Energy. Okay. <laughs> no, no. They, the conversation about about uh, reduction is over now. The yeah. conversation needs to switch yep. to the producers of energy mm -hmm. and bring us clean energy. Enough's enough. That's where it's got to go. But color temperature. Right. Amateur podcast host here. I believe there's something to low Kelvin temperature at night that comes from our evolution and our relationship to fire. And I think there's something there that needs to be studied. There's something about dimming lights and dim warm, like that warm dim. You take, know what I'm talking take about? It, take it away from fire, which has only been around for a couple million years. Go back, go back a bit further in the, in the whole evolutionary um, plane. And when the sun is on the horizon, and there's particulate oh, sure. matter in the air. That's why it's golden yellow yeah. um, in the morning and in the evening in, in, most, in many cases. And studies, early work with LED lighting and poultry um, uh, shows that... That's a whole other topic too, yeah. Shows that, that, um, that using golden-hued lighting, warm CCT, uh, in the evening is much more productive uh, for, the, for the chicken farmer. Mark Jewell came on and said that uh, using the correct kind of lighting for pork farming also. Yep, the, that same group that did the yeah. early poultry work, it, it, and they did, they've they've increased um, uh, egg laying by eight percent. Milk production um, too, and then and then it went into the pork industry, and now they're in the dairy industry as yeah. well. And and uh, dairy cattle, they call them the girls, um, uh, that are that are able to walk over to the self milking machines, do so three times a day, um, to release the. The pressure in their in their udders, whereas uh, farmers have have done for hundreds of years two times a day. So often, if we if we just let the system figure itself out, it does much better than we do. Sure. So color temperature. Mm -hmm. There's something to warm color temperatures then for sure. I, I, when I, I when you say you there's mean. when you, there's something to it, there's absolutely something. There's something. Yeah. I mean, it's it's how our what is our relationship our, to that? Why why is it that? What does it do to us? Why is it that we like 
warm Kelvin temperature. You mean lighting. beyond a pina colada and, and dancing under the yeah, stars? Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, sometimes that girl looks a lot nicer when in a warm color. You get on your own side <laughs> in a 5,000, okay, whoa! <laughs> you look so much better on that dim to warm. <laughs> well, if, if you, I don't know, but if you consider what we probably used to do evolutionarily, uh, we'd, we'd, um, we'd leave the cave in the morning and we'd be hungry and we'd have a, a, a full days of activity uh, to either fend, you know, fend and find berries and, and fruit or sure. go and kill something. Yeah. And, and that was, that's pretty high, high anxiety, at least running after animals and, and trying to kill something. Um, and, and as the day winds down and the evening sun comes on, and we start to relax and we get ready for sleep. I don't know about you, but that sounds that sounds that sounds pretty good to me to associate the the warm uh, yellow hue with relaxation yeah. and pre sleep. And sure. and in our and what we know today is in our circadian cycle, uh, when we wake up, we have about twelve hours of alertness. Uh, the the our, our biological uh, system starts to shift, and within uh, four hours, we have a lot of physiological glandular changes. Within four hours, we're looking for a place to put our head on a pillow, and if we're in if we're in good sleep health, uh, one might say that within 15 minutes we're sound asleep of putting our head on a pillow, and we wake up when the sun comes up. Um, I dare say that's not how most people see their lives today. That's how my life works, actually, though. That must be a Canadian thing. Yeah, I know. Just I don't know. It's just a Michael Colligan thing. Like I, as soon as I lay down, I boom, I go to sleep, and then I'm wake up in the morning and well, rock kicking I, cats, buddy. I have to admit when it, when I. <laughs> I have to admit, when I when my head hits the pillow, I'm usually asleep before it hits it. Okay. However, I'm, I'm not certain that that's because you drank seven beers. The whole <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually don't drink, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Mark, I'm sorry, Adam. I was going to call you Mark, Adam Lulian. Jesus, and my mind is blown by these health effects, Greg. Yeah, it's still something to be determined. It's always interesting to hear the the different ideas and to see a recommended practice. I like I like seeing that. You know, now what? we got to dive into it. In six months, you could be talking about circadian effect what is that what is it that, that um there's a you guys have you had a good name for it circadian um training no no it was a circadian effective lighting design criteria yeah. could be coming out hot in the next six months we're hoping uh to receive as many requests to be commenters on the on the um uh, pre-publication of this recommended practice oh. and uh and How people do do um uh, people can can uh, send me an email to adam dot uh, or a d a m dot l i l i e n at ul dot com. We'll post that on the. Uh, we'll post a link to push that, so it's and, not out there. But you're, and I'm I'm, have I'm to hoping that. to have people from all over the world uh, weigh in, sure. uh, because the the more input we can get, the better the better the end product will be. It, the the product is not finished as it is. It needs it. It can it can constantly be improved. And uh, and should it become a, a published recommended practice, it needs to it needs to have uh, a worldwide audience to really change what we need to change. We'll start it right here on the Get a Grip on Learning podcast. There we go. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Greg. Kurtzon.com. Go to K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. That's Kurtzon.com. They're check them out at Lightfair. What booth are they, Greg? 2058. Whoa, say that again. You gotta pay your you gotta pay your internet bill. What 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 booth number was that? Chopping out? It's chopping out. Two seven two seven five eight. Two seven five eight seven fifty eight. You know what? They're where they need to be, and they're a great American manufacturer. They're older, almost as old as Canada, Kurtzon. So you go to Kurtzon.com. That's K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby, for that specification grade. The leaders with the best warranty put right on their website, the 5 slash 10. They never messed around with all that 10-year hocus-pocus mumbo-jumbo stuff. Kurtzon.com. That's K-U-R-T-Z-O-N.com, baby. And, of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, who will also have a booth at Light Fair. Go down there, check them out. I'm not sure where it's going to be. It's where all the good booths are. We'll be there. I'm going to find it when I get there. And we're going to be recording from that booth, some podcasts right out of the Nail booth. So go there, check us out, nail.org. Join us. And that is also where we met and interviewed Adam Lillian. So remember, Nailed the leaders. This this organization is really going to grow, Greg. Yeah, bright future. we got a lot coming up. Had a lot of great discussions at the convention and a lot more future. You know, I'm bringing back the tagline, light made easy. You know, the circadian Canadian here is uh, 
wondering how all this is going to play out. If the science really does come forward, like the Adam Lillian from UL says, Greg, it's going to be an interesting couple who the next 10 years just got a heck of a lot more interesting, if it's true. Another ride. Another ride to take, huh? Let's go. Take the ride. Listen to the show. Join Nailed. You got it, folks. We're always grateful to all of you out there, our listeners, our, our YouTube viewers, our commenters, our guests, and our sponsors. Greg and I are super humbled by you guys. So thanks for listening. Thanks for checking us out. And don't forget, I have my own show. It's called the Get a Grip on Life Show. Oh, yeah, baby. Are you into that? Are you into my opinions? Well, check me out, getagriponlife.com. That's right, is my personal website. And you know what? Every now and then... The Minnesotan comes out and hosts one of those shows with me. I think there's two. I think you did two with me so far, right? Co-host. I sneak in there every now and then. Yeah, two. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening, guys. See if Again, you can find me. See if you can find him. <laughs> he says the odd thing every now and then. Get a grip on life.com. And of course, this is Get a Grip on Lighting. Thanks for listening, guys. All the best. Boom! Written on the rectory wall. There's a sign there for all. You are lost. Lord is there to find you.